So pre going and, and coming back, like, yeah. what's the distinctive thing that you can see where a mindset has changed? Like, it's, it's it changed for you or given you something different after going to war and coming back? Was there anything? Yeah, I mean, one of the things we, the British militia wasn't good at, I don't know if it is now, hopefully it is, it was decompression. You know, you go to you go to a war conflict and the tempo is massive, as you can mean. The work rate is massive. There is no finish line. You don't know when this is going to end because you don't know where it's going to go. You don't really know what's going to come around the next corner and what's going to co confront you next. Like I say, you plan for everything but be, pre be prepared for the unexpected. And you always get that. So you kind of tuned into that, you tune into that fear, to that environment, and you get on with it. And then what we used to do, you come home and you go straight back into supposedly normal life. Well, that's difficult when, you know, you may have lost people or you may have seen this or you may have seen that and you've got this crazy aggressive mentality in your head and you get home and then you, you kind of, you haven't had time to decompress it and let it calm down and, okay, put that to bed now. You straight into, supposedly another life. It's, we um, binge life, we binge this craziness straight into binge normality, what normality is being at home with a family or with your friends or, and we don't get the time to, you know, filter that badness or the, the aggressive bit out and straight into it. So you go into it, you, you become a little bit aggressive, a little bit, don't see what the everyday problem in civilian street is when you've just had somebody who's got no house, no family, half the family missing, that's a real problem. Not the fucking washing machine's broke or the car's been stolen or the kids had a fight at school. So it's, you're like, so what? You know, you know, you, that's kind of the mood swings and difficulties of coming from a high tempo, crazy world into a supposedly normal and then back into that again. I think now, and I hope that, you know, when people come back from conflict and and these places, they get that period of decompress, talk amongst yourselves first, get it out, po chest poke each other before you get home, get things out of, out of your plate, sort yourself out, get checked out, and then go home, because it's unfair. Because the people at home, are, 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 when you're in war and conflict, they're out in war and conflict, worrying where the hell you are, what's going on, and, and you know, trying to keep the house together, the family together, your friends together. So, that was difficult, I think, and that's why, you know, a lot of issues we're having today are happening because people haven't had a chance to decompress and get shit off the chest. And it's always, for a soldier, you know, you, you always think about, if only I'd have stepped to the left, that could have happened. If only I'd have done this, if only I'd done that. Or I could look at it and go, well, Jordan, that was your fault. You should have told me to do that. Or I'd get that off your plate before you go home, because that's on your plate, and you end, inevitably you end up taking it out of your, your wife, your partner, you know, your aggression and they're like, whoa, where did that come from? So that's the difference in terms of mentally managing and mood swings and, you know. Yeah. So uh, 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 for yourself throughout your career, your, mili your military career, were some of the harder times when you got back home? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll be honest, I mean, I did, I, I enjoyed the, the tempo of, you know, what the regiment was all about and what conflict and I loved it and I wanted more of it well, I didn't want to miss out you know it's not until you get older you realize actually what you're missing out on is your proper life back home kids growing up or doing things or whatever it might be yeah so I, I loved it and then a lot of people do you, you're almost volunteering for the next mission if you could and we all every I think everybody did you know and yeah so I enjoyed it while, while it was out I knew it was a, a time frame that you could do this for and I just wanted to get as much as I possibly could out of it. Keep going back and doing whatever it might be and not always in conflict, sometimes it was in, you know, natural disaster type stuff. But helping, getting out there, doing some different situation, thinking on your feet and making a difference. That's what it was all about and I loved it, I loved every minute of it. So for yourself, was there a mindset of moving through to get to special forces and like continually bettering yourself? Yeah, there's, I think there's all, everybody should always have a goal to go forward, you know, whatever that might be. Yeah, and it was always to do, once that job's done, it's done, that's history. Stop patting yourself on the back and telling yourself how great it was and all the rest of it. Move on. What comes next? What's the next challenge? And I've always had that mentality of, what can I do next? What, when's my next chance to do something decent and challenge myself? So what, what, for yourself, stepping into Special Forces, what was, what was the 
not a lure, but like, what was the pull for you? The pull was, I mean, first thing I wanted to go into Special Forces, one, to prove I could do it. Like I did that, that young 17 year old kid stood on the square looking at people and thinking, can I do it again? Am I capable? And it's, I had the same feelings. Standing on the square with all these hundreds of people thinking, wow, they all look better, they all look fitter. Can I do this? So that was one reason I wanted to challenge myself. Can I do it? Of course I did. Secondly is, I knew what they were doing was making a difference. You know, a massive difference. Although, you know, the army are making a difference, this was a different level. You remember special forces work at tier one. Tier one is world changing decisions. It's government level, you know, we're not just doing this because we need to do, this is going to make a massive difference. The London bombings or releasing an hostage or whatever it is. This is going to make a massive impact on the country and possibly the world. That's tier one level stuff. So yeah, can we dive into that a little bit more basically, like ex explain what it is, because I think there's a confusion around how uh, different levels of military work and yeah. so yeah, what is tier one? So, uh, you know, Special Forces units is small. So it's tier one is government level operations that will change policy in terms of how the country runs, our security mainly, um, how on a world scale, you know, we'll change X amount of people being killed, wars happening, stopping um, internal conflicts in other countries, which will inevitably have an effect on our country later on, whether that be because of troop deployment, because of an economy, because of global terrorism, whatever it is. So strategic level operational stuff is tier one. And so it's a small group of people, which is generally the SAS, you know, special forces, um, that deal with that sort of stuff. Is, is there a thing, so, Within special forces, do you have to sort of work up to doing tier one stuff or...? No, special forces, once you're into special forces, you do SAS training. There's nothing special about SAS training. That is a selective process for you to become a specialist in the next, your next journey in, in the regiment. And once you get into the regiment, you're then trained to do everything from linguist to demolition to whatever it takes to get a job done. So that's where the specialist part of SAS is. And then, as you, as you progress, like anywhere else, you start at the bottom, but there's no real rank structure. Everybody's, everybody's as important as each other. You all have your input, you all have your input. However, when you go through these, these missions, tier one missions, which is like I say, government level, the London bombings was a tier one operation, for example, you know, that is gonna change because suicide bombing, how do we stop this? How do we make the country secure again? Not just the country, but you know, uh, you know, our, Ireland, everywhere else that support with us and support us. How do we stop this? That's a tier one operation. In order to lead that, it's led from the top. Nobody below, really it's run from the commanding officer of the regiment. He runs the tier one, passed down to the OC, which is the gang that are gonna do it. And then the groundwork is the sergeant major, which is why I was. They're the only people who lead tier one missions. Nobody below that. People below that, sergeants, staff sergeants, they lead parts of that mission to, to achieve that aim. But the lead is really from the top and stops really at the sergeant major level. So you build your way up to that. 